Awesome. What's up, everyone? So this is David Otto. Um, he's a musician, has a band um, from Brisbane, Australia. Now, his partner, Kitty Lee, had reached out to me. Um, I'm in virtually all of the Marilyn Manson groups on Facebook, and she found me there, um, asked for my like advice, opinion on some things. So like I looked into it. I signed the petition read all of these accusations like from my point of view like david's great musician i've checked his music out you'll um you're all welcome to like check his music out as well form your own opinion but you know it seems to me like he's another victim of of this cancel culture that's been going on that um you know just false accusations you know no real side they're not showing his side of the story Things are being like kept from you know the public. Um, from what I understand, um, Kitty had told me that they put like uh, they froze your bank accounts, put a travel ban on you. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll let you go ahead and like explain everything to the viewers. Well, I guess the, you know? um, I I imagine Kitty might have sent you the link. Um, uh, my name's David, by the way, and yeah, uh, that's all correct. Everything you've just said. Uh, I appreciate you spending some time to talk about this. Uh, I, I think the best place to start for somebody if they want to really find out what was happening with this thing is uh, we've got a page uh, and it's a Facebook page now called The End of Liars, which I guess is what our campaign is back against this. And the the background of the whole thing is on that page there that goes through this like systematic sabotage that's gone on with this. Um, it's a bit of a standout case of it because, I mean, cancel culture is often something that's, you know, negative mentions on online and there's a little bit of trolling like this 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 has been a little bit different to that this has been a systematic kind of um sabotage and disadvantage using courts through media yes online as well um there's been bribing of people there may have even been dropped bribing of a judge at one point um so there's been quite a campaign behind this for a good five or six years now um and the, the why is, is kind of clear the further you look into it. But in terms of a starting point, uh, that End of Liars page and a link to a, a, basically a diary of the history of this is a good starting point for people to get the actual facts on it. Um, but, yeah, it's definitely been been interesting and it's definitely not, not factual. Um, well, one thing, I, one thing I noticed, which I see nothing wrong with at all whatsoever, is that they would show, you know, that you were looking for band members, you know, like mm. what's wrong with that? You know, like they would put out like, oh, look, look here, he put an ad out looking for, you know, like come join my band, you know, whatever, like yeah. what, Yeah, there should be nothing wrong with oh, that. But, you know, they twist it's it actually, to make it seem like. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny because there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with it. And that's actually the problem because we're so industrious, we're so hardworking, we, we've just got, you know, a lot of capabilities in terms of being able to set up our own whole machine when it comes to music. I mean, we don't, we don't care about like what the rest of the industry is kind of, you know, holding musicians at, at the neck for. We just build everything ourselves. We build out our own social media, our own marketing systems. We book our own tours, all the music. We wrote it all ourselves and recorded it all ourselves. So we sort of, we sort of don't need the, the rest of the industry that way. Um, and I think that was where the problem began because if other people were to do what we were doing, record companies immediately would be just completely gone. And maybe that's what they saw as a, as a threat. Um, but at the same time, um, there's what they've done is is something. It's very it's a very high level journalistic kind of thing where they've taken something and they've actually um, this Channel Nine entity. They they're quite a, a conglomerate. They own a, a company called Ticket Tech. They have control of all the major venues around the country here, and. Um, they actually got fined by the government back in, I think, 2011 for doing this exact thing, for, for sabotaging somebody who was entering into the live event industry. So they've definitely got a bit of a template that if they identify somebody who can do their own thing, um, they then got like this list of words. They go, okay, it doesn't matter whether these things are true. We've got a list of negative words that will cause people to disperse away from that person. We'll construct sentences mm -hmm. around that. 
We'll then chase them around a bit and film them, see if we can get anything to add up, even if it doesn't, even when it doesn't, they, they concoct it together into these few minute pieces. So the, the fun thing is that that all breaks apart on them as soon as even a little bit of the truth comes out. So that's why I appreciate being able to talk about this and for people to actually peel apart what happened here, hopefully to prevent it happening to anybody else, but for people to actually understand what happened here and then to see beneath all that, the great opportunity that we do actually offer to come to our shows as a fan or able to plan the band. But you're right, it's it's innocuous what we do, and I guess that's where the hard work was in trying to stitch together something negative about it. And that's another thing I noted, like, we talked pre-stream about this, like, already, you know, they're kind of dragging your name through the mud, calling you a failed musician when, you know, I don't really <laughs> right. think any musician can be a failure if you're playing music, you know, um, you know, right. they're calling right. you, like, uh, a con man for trying to find band members like none of it adds up you know like it They're seems to me words, like this. Yeah. now i would like to ask like did did the travel ban everything did that start like when the allegations and like um west hollywood like somebody uh, prior, alleged, to that. Something. prior. prior to that okay um, yeah, because this is why that, that End of Lives page is, is really a useful resource because it diarizes the timeline of it and it shows the date, um, basically the sequence of that page. It shows what we did to advance the band forward and then from them just watching everything we do, what they then did in response to sabotage that. There's more than 30 instances where we've gone to do something to advance the band, play overseas or, you know, Get, out, get ourselves out there, and they've come in from the sidelines to, to attack that way. But in terms of that particular instance, with um, there's a financial and travel ban that they put on us, and this is by the executives at the TV station have organised this, and they did that directly in response to our, I guess, retaliation to us standing up for our rights. So after they told this, the very first story that they made up and then told to the country was that when we put a concert on, we have no intention of actually getting up and playing, which might be the maddest yeah, thing. Yeah, that's, that's, that's ever, another know, thing I noticed. Band. Like someone said, like, you know, there's no one there. And then I see performances, you know, on like um, <laughs> one of your Facebook and it's like. Yeah. And they kept that story up, even though they know that I've been to performing my, my first concert. I was like 12 years old. I've played live. Like likewise, 500 likewise, times. Like, yeah. Yeah, man, it's 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 just such a nuts thing to say. But what it's about is about trying to cause distrust. What what they're reading in between the lines, what they're trying to do with that particular line is to say, hey, look, if you actually buy a ticket to this guy's show, we don't want you to think he's going to turn up when the show is going to be great, even though it is going to be. And it's it's trying to cause a, dis, a distrust. So. Where it led to the travel and financial ban is because we then we then sued them in the court. Uh, they totally underestimated how litigious I am and, and how much history I've got. I, I almost studied law. Uh, if it wasn't for music, finding that first, I would have probably become a lawyer. So that came by a bit of surprise right. to them. And what then happened was we stood up, we made a filing in the court, we then got some good lawyers to then um, you know stand up for us and make that happen. And I think they were a bit taken aback by that. So their response was the following thing. They somehow managed to lie to the court to get a hold of our house. This is like the band house where we rehearse and, and develop the show to go on right. tour. They got a hold of that and they said, basically, look, if you stop the defamation case and if you stop trying to stand up for yourself and telling your side of the story, we'll give you your house back. This, it was extortion. And what had happened was we were already sort of knee deep in with the lawyers, the pro bono lawyers. So, whether we continued with the case or whether we stopped was immaterial because if we if we said, oh, hey, look, we're going to stop after these guys have done less work, like there would have been costs anyway. So um, apart from the fact that, you know, they'd lied clearly and they needed to settle that with us, um, they must have known that they'd done that wrong because they made this extortion threat. And because there was basically we were at a point of no return in the court case, they just proceeded through, through the federal court, um, got the band house into their name so they appointed this trustee who then had complete control of our finances and they they then continued to there's like four or five letters between that was um october 2017 the court case wasn't until 2019 so nothing official had been decided yet this is two years beforehand there's four or five letters following that point up to 2019 of other threats saying hey look pull out or we'll take your house pull out or we'll take your house they still have control of that house four years later 
and we've had to live in a different place because they kept on turning up with more cameras at that location. And, um, yeah, that was basically the threat out of standing up for ourselves. That's why they took it. Um, yeah, that that's included one, a another thing I travel. noticed. Yeah, another thing I noticed is, like, they would try to catch you at airports, you know, and approach oh, you yeah. with their cameras. So is that What's something you've had to deal with a lot? Like, is, like, oh, an invasion yeah. of privacy? Oh, well, what's concerning about that is, like, how how did they know? Like, we weren't very public about the, like, when we went over, um, we, we booked a gig at the Rambo Room um, in August of 2019. Um, but it was pretty quiet. You know, it was just a bit of an industry type of thing to showcase what the concept was. Uh, we'd only talk privately with the band members that we were training um, over Zoom calls to be able to play the songs. So how they even knew that we were going on that trip was a little shady. Um, but they were, they were definitely tracking the whole thing, um, the angle that they'd filmed us at over there. Uh, the woman who was there at the Rambo Room seemed a little out of place when I look back. So there's definitely a, there's like a stalking sort of campaign that goes on with it. And um, But they, it's, it's simply about whenever we step up like that, they, they're wanting to be there every time to try to kind of slice the head off of it so it doesn't rise. And they've, they've got a history of doing that. But I think in our case, they've really never seen anything quite like this before, somebody who's that resilient. And they, they don't quite know what to do because we keep surviving their attacks and keep on advancing to make the band better anyway. Yeah, and I, as that's we, one thing, you know, um, as, like, horrible they are, that's one thing that they at least give you credit for is they're like, you know, he had tried, you know, to sue us, you know, like he's filed lawsuits against us, you know. Like, so clearly, you know, you're not, you know, I would think someone guilty wouldn't be the one trying right. to counteract. You know, that would make no sense whatsoever. But um, you're right. You're exactly right. Yeah. And then I yeah, noticed the that um, I really enjoyed, um, and I think this is where they might have gotten. They're like, don't go to his performances. Like, there's no one there, or whatever. Like, I actually liked your response because I'm sure any musician, like me personally, I, you know, you. Um, Virtually any musician has, like, played, you know, a solo show, you know, where there aren't many people or, you know, maybe online or something. But, like, I liked how um, they said, like, there were, like, zero people and you were, like, zero is a number, you know, like, so technically, you know, <laughs> I, I enjoyed, like, that bit of sarcasm. But, yeah, like, I think they took that one piece and just, you know, used that. Like how most journalists do in the mainstream media, they don't have anything to write about. So they'll twist no. things to fit their own personal agenda. And mm -hmm. I, I wasn't aware of that, that what you just told me that like nothing was really public on your whereabouts, where you guys were going. So it seems to me like they were trying to, the media was trying to create almost like this boogeyman, yeah. you know, of, from Brisbane or something. Yeah, that is exactly right. And that's what I mean. They, they begin um, with how they want somebody to look. Because once they identify, okay, this person might be independent, they, they may be, you know, able to gather their, their following. And what, the way they see that, because they're a, a media institution that's got their own ticketing, got their own events, anything else is competition. So if they mm -hmm. identify that somebody else might want to go to David's concert or Patricio's concert and then they've bought a ticket to that one, then maybe they, they can't afford to go to one of the ones that they're putting on. They see that as a threat to their market share. And, man, it, it comes down to what the, the public wants to see. Like if they like your music more and they go to your concert, that's how business works. Uh, and instead of just yeah. being better, they, they, you know, they do this stuff. So I think they identified there was an industrious person with some big goals and then they went, okay, this is somebody that's got to be on our on our shit list. And but then they build out the list of the words and the things that they want to say about that and try to kind of stitch together something about that person. But I haven't seen media behave that childishly in any other part of the world. So, you know, it's one of those funny things in this particular country where they're like that. Another thing um worth mentioning is, you know, how they try painting like this picture, you know, all of these false allegations, which to me you know, nothing seems, like I said, out of line. Like, they listed, yeah. you know, that um, Kitty was, like, interested in um, what they refer to as a victim who was never, they never list was victimized. You know, there was no sexual no. assault or anything like that. No. But, um, you know, um, it seems to me that, like, 
they didn't like well first and foremost i don't think that these alleged victims would you know fly out or want to be involved at all in the first place if they weren't interested or knew what was going on so um yeah you know i i saw through that right away but you know mm. it's just crazy that you know i see it happen well, all the time and it's just a shame you know that it, it is and it's interesting that um the uh, it's interesting that you're from a manson group because um about about a month a month or two before the actual trial in the early early 2019 um Kitty had, it's, this is in that end of lies page, Kitty had actually reached out to one of the girls that she knew well as a friend for a couple of years before Nine bribed her and sabotaged her to lie on, on the TV. And what happened was because she reached out to this girl and said, look, can you please just tell the truth and get this thing over with so we can get on with our lives? Well, look, instead of just telling the truth and getting on with it, uh, the next minute we actually get a gag order from the court saying that we're not allowed to ask people to tell the truth in the court, right? And um, which is kind of shocking. And as a result of that, I thought, wow, this is getting to the point whereby they want to be able to tell this fake story and make it illegal for us to tell the truth. So that just made rose something up in me. I'm like, right, I've got to make sure that, that the story is out there for people to know the truth about this. So I wrote a 500 page biography in about two months of my entire life history. And um, it was interesting, there was a, a, a section in one of them, because as these as these fake accusations started to get really full on, really serious, because we wouldn't back down and stop playing shows, why would we? And um, I actually made a reference to it that, you know, if, if Marilyn Manson, um, you know, if somebody was saying, you know, the story that he, you know, removed one of his one of his ribs, I think. Um, oh, yeah, you know, that it, rumor started it, in the early 90s, yeah. Or not yeah, the early, mid, like late like 90s, yeah. Yeah, so like making up a rumor like that's innocuous. Like you know, oh yeah, you had a rib removed, and you know, so what if people say stuff like that on the internet? But but if the story was, oh, he had a rib removed, and you know, he was trying to remove other people's ribs, and then the police actually charged him with it, and he went through a trial for removing other people's ribs. This is the degree of severity that they've run this through too, and it, it shows you to sort of weigh up what what they've done with this compared to just silly like good or bad press but it's stuff that doesn't sound that doesn't sound true but you know it's funny sort of pop culture stuff but that's what they've done with this to push that all the way through so as a result i built out this full um, biography of of the band's whole history so people would know in case they tried to try to kind of stop us from talking ever they tried to keep the gag order on after the court case but i made submissions myself personally to the court um, so they were compelled. They had to lift the gag order off. So we're able to talk about this now. And um, I've actually, in terms of the uh, integrity or lack of integrity and in the, the character of, of the girls that they've managed to be able to bribe, because there are so many hundreds and hundreds of people who have been positively involved with the band that would never go on TV and, and, and lie for them like that. They were only able to get the, the sort of the, the scruffy edges of people who, who had been involved to be able to cock, you know, concoct that story. But as a result of the amount of lying that was going on, I wrote another book uh, after completing their biography and um, it's called Contradictions, Cross Contradictions, Conflicts and Lies. Yeah, um, I'd be interested in reading that. And um, one thing, yeah. you know, that goes along with that is, um, especially with people, you know, unable to speak the truth is a lot of like mm -hmm. Manson's alleged victims, like especially the more famous ones, they claim that he he forced them to watch a homemade snuff film. Well, what? The media, yeah, the media is portraying that, you know, like, you know, that it's a video called Groupie, but the actress in the video, like, it was supposed to be like an art film. She was paid for it. She's alive. She actually came out uh -huh. and did an interview and, and said, you know, like, no, she had dated Manson. Like, we had a plan. Like, I was going to come over as a, like, obsessed fan you know things went from there just because it looks real doesn't mean it is i'm alive mm -hmm. you know but yeah the mainstream media in america to this day like if there's like an article about like one of his you know accusers they'll, it'll mention you know this video called groupie but it will not mention the fact that the woman paula vice who was 
the one supposedly tortured and killed. It was in was acting, you know, it was a complete, you know. Right. Yeah. They won't mention that, but they'll just drag someone's yeah. name through the mud in the media and let, you know, like I guess people that don't do their own research just have this like negative impression, you know, because they're mm. not letting the truth be revealed. They're only letting the the liars speak. Yeah. Well, it's when I was writing that that contradictions book, I actually had people like Manson and Johnny Depp and what had happened with us. I had that in mind as I was drafting this book, and it was an interesting um, it, moment of inspiration and epiphany when I when I went to write it because um, I actually researched what the process is that a, a, a judge or a magistrate uses when they're assessing for truth in a courtroom. There's a really scientific process that they step through to assess whether that person in the courtroom is lying or not. And I then built the book around that step-by-step -step process. And that's why the actual chapter headings are contradictions, cross-contradictions. So the first thing you look for to identify a liar is if there's contradictions in their story. If they say, yeah, I was there, or no, I wasn't there. If they say both those things at, at the same time, at the same about the same event, sorry, um, obviously mm -hmm. one of those two has to be a lie because it's impossible for those, both of those things to be true. So if you go systematically through what the person claims, even just at that first point, it becomes pretty easy to identify a liar. And a cross contradiction is if somebody else is sort of on their side, conflicts with what they were saying. So like if if one person says, oh, no, that phone was used to make a phone call, but then a person who was there at the same time says, no, no, the other phone was used. It's like, hang on, why would anybody lie about that? What's really going on here? And conflicts is if somebody says something that is in conflict with a piece of evidence. So there's a video or a photograph or a document which disagrees with the claim the person's making. And if the person's got contradictions and they've gone to the point of having conflicts in their story, there's no way that what they're saying is true. And none of these examples that you're talking about would stand the test of even those first three. And another thing I've noticed um, in, in like, from the research I've done is that a lot of, you know, and not just with you, but with others, you know, a lot of stories seem to like conveniently be the same, you know, from right. the alleged <laughs> victims, you know, like, you know, like, like obviously like in, if it was a real situation, it, the circumstances would be different, but it's like each alleged victim's statement is like reads the exact same. And, you know, yeah. a lot, one thing I noticed is that there really isn't much anything really negative other than, you know, like no one's out there saying, you know, like they were sexually assaulted, really. They, they were, they're just saying like, oh, they wanted to sexually assault me or they wanted to do uh, this or the, it's like, but, you know, like where's, where's the police reports? There are none. You know, like, where's... Yeah, and it relies on, like, oh, you must be, like, are you mind reading or something to come up with these? Are these, like, insecure assumptions? Um, but, yeah, whenever whenever a claim is made, um, and a more, more, the more specific the claim is that somebody makes, they, they then are making another claim which contradicts it. There's evidence that, that conflicts with it, you know? And even further down the line, any any one of those things, as, as you say, you, you wouldn't be out there trying to clear your name if there was actually something going on wrong. And further, mm -hmm. furthermore, when you get to the actual character of these people, you look at the other things that they've lied about and the types of sordid behaviour they get into in their everyday lives, they do not have the character of somebody that should really be, like, trusted. Um, and, and beyond that, there's a motive for these people to lie. You know, they get approached. Like, um, some of the girls have actually, who, who've been approached um, by nine, have actually said to me in private, look, they approached me and this is how they did it. And they explain, hey, what happens is one of the lawyers emails you and sends you the, their, all their past fake material to sort of brainwash the person in, into being in a certain state of mind. And then they do. They offer them money to get up and sit in front of the camera. And then once the poor girl's sitting there in, in, in front of Channel 9's camera, they're just feeding them lies for them to then repeat back to them. And then they chop that together to make a story. And that that's how seedy that that process is um they're not beginning with the truth it, it's a it's a sabotage campaign um for a specific purpose that way so it's it's important that people understand that the media is capable of stuff like that and and what these girls are actually missing out on as a result of falling for those things you know the shame that they'd have to go through and 
um, you know, they, they wouldn't feel good about themselves after they'd done that to somebody who was so nice to them, I'm sure. Right. And, you know, that's good that you had somebody that wanted to speak out and it's a shame that they weren't allowed to, you know. Um. <clears throat> They're coming through. You know, we actually do have more and more now. Um, you know, we've we pioneered to, to combat all of this. And this, again, is something that the media wasn't kind of prepared for. We, we pioneered a movement called uh, record or hashtag record everything. So what, what we do now, when, whenever the band is, is with the public or going to shows or traveling, we always like 24 seven have a constant audio recording of what's going on. So you've got a digital track of what actually happens. And it's proof, amazing. Yeah. So no one can yeah, twist. So the lines are just says. dot. Like, uh, there, there's been people who I'm pretty sure Nina has been tampering with that have been unable to proceed with a lie story because of this Record Everything campaign. So I'd suggest that for anybody that's in the public eye, if you're a politician or a, a successful business person or a musician, if you feel like you're in that echelon where somebody might want to say a story that's not true about you, uh, the devices these days all have, you know, audio recording Microphone, systems on. They're yeah. really good when to check it, but record everything because then if somebody starts to, starts to make something up, you can go, okay, what date and time did that apparently happen? You can just go back to your catalog and go, well, sorry, uh, you're exactly. lying. Yeah. This person, you know? So um, you've got to be a bit you know, forensic about it now <laughs> to, to protect yourself. Yeah, so... Um... That's one thing like that really stood out because like I did my research, you know, and everything, you know, I just don't have anybody on, you know, and like I was really like hearing the story and seeing, you know, through everything, you know, for me, you know, I'm able to like see what's bullshit and what isn't, you know, and like Correct. to me, like it's completely unjust, you know, I signed the petition, you know, like she had reached yeah. out to me when I got, um, when I finally got it when I saw it in my message requests and read it, you know, and looked through everything and, and checked you out and everything, you know, like I immediately yeah. signed the petition, you know, um, awesome. asked if, if you would be willing or wanting to do an interview and get this oh. out there. So, um, yeah. thank you for that. But, um, how has this like impacted, like, is this still like affecting your daily life? Yeah, the, the way it's done that um, is there, there's been a lot of like uh, legal troubles. Like we were, we were basically in court every month for about six years because of some complication caused by these articles. That is all completely behind us now. And there's, there's no kind of court dates up in front of us. The challenge that we've got still now is that their fake material is still sitting up on Google. So when people Google the band mm. name or Google my name, they're getting these fake allegation kind of concoctions that they've put up and it's difficult to get in your feed because when you book, you know, we had this happen last year, you, you book a venue, you start promoting it, and then the venue manager actually breaks their contract, sign contract and says, oh, sorry, look, because they, they've got it in their head, oh, the, they're not going to turn up for the event, which is just crazy the amount of times we turn up and just play even just for promotional purposes but yeah every from a day-to-day -day point of view that's the sort of thing that we face and and the most devastating part of it is with band members where we have people who are then learning to play the band songs even some experienced musicians still need to be given coaching as to exactly how to play the, some of the songs so the riffs are kind of complex and right. you put that time in with the person and it's a time bomb that they then see their fake material, and even when they know that it's fake, they can't be associated. And they're the saddest scenarios that I've seen where they're just apologetic and like, man, I, I know that they've lied about you, but it's just it's so severe what they're trying to say about you that they suffer in their own lives and they don't want to be right. targeted. So they, yeah, they wouldn't want to. I understand that. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to keep a band together, trying to hold a booking once we get it. Um, it, it any time that they then encounter that material, it bounces off. So kind of building that mountain of your, of your fan base to be able to travel more and play in better and cooler places 
it's it's there sort of you know chewing away at that at the moment so that's why the really the next step with it is this petition because petitions work like like they sound like they they may not have teeth but if you have enough people on a petition and then usually it takes to have a lawyer or somebody official to actually present the petition to the to the opposing side it can really have some impact so we've really got to get that material down off the internet um they've got to give us our house back <laughs> And they, you know, even this is even before these COVID travel restrictions. Uh, they made it so the band could not leave the country. Um, and when I was about to buy more tickets, this is when they they had actually closed um, the Visa card account because they got in control of our finances through uh, through the order to take the house. It was just complete carte blanche, you know, control of any of our of our resources like that. And it's still in place now. Um, yeah, that was one so thing I was wondering. Because you mentioned like pre-COVID and one of the articles that was saying, um, well, they made it seem like, which to me, like, clearly was like a distortion of reality. But they made it seem mm -hmm. that like you guys had left L.A., you know, like 48 hours after an alleged incident. Well, that's two days later. You would think if someone was trying to flee or get away, they wouldn't wait two days. They would be out of there, you know, at the airport trying to flee right away. So is that yeah. like when the real like travel like ban happened, like right no, after no, no, no. you got back? No, it was already put on two years before that. No, they already actively put it on as an aggressive uh, deterrent two years before we were in LA in August in 2019. And, and as you're saying, they hide a lot of stuff from the public. And that's why this, the full facts on the end of lies page is so important for people to know is because they, they were our ticketed dates. Like we, we bought the tickets before we left to, to leave Australia on that date. We had two shows booked on the Monday and the Wednesday night. And then to leave later, like on the Wednesday night after the show, like that was when it was organized yeah. to, to actually travel it was already pre-booked that way and it's crazy because when you look at what the allegation actually is they're saying that the intention was to assault somebody and to steal a mobile phone but they're sort of keeping it out of the public's view that hang on it costs between four and five thousand dollars to go from australia to america to stay there and look after yourself while you're there and get back and ubers and everything in between um, when you look at that, that doesn't make any sense. Why is a person paying four thousand dollars when you can go down the store and buy a phone for a hundred bucks? Like, but they hide all that stuff. That that whole allegation doesn't make any sense. And the travel ban was already in place before that. And we had to keep getting special permission to be able to do something that everyday everyday person can just do. This is why it's, the story is much more shocking and ridiculous when you actually know the the timeline of when they were doing these things. And always as a retaliation to us getting up on our feet. But how they knew that we were flying overseas, I guess it's because they're looking to our bank accounts and they would have seen the flight purchases. Um, so they would have known where we were going, where we're staying and, and all of that. So that's um, one thing that I noticed is that in, in that article about um, like supposedly like stealing a phone, like, you know, it clearly states you returned the phone. You know, she has no, her but, phone. Like, it was never stolen. But there was, yeah, exactly. But there was no like, phone ever stolen. And, and if you have a look at her, um, she she went and made, like, a report that was that just was completely trumped up. And when it – she didn't even claim that the phone was stolen on a police report. It was like, well, why are you claiming that if you – when it comes to you actually, like, signing off to on a police statement as, as to what's happening, you didn't say that your phone was stolen. So why are you saying that to the media, but you're not prepared to say it in a police report? Come on. That's right. something about a contradiction. So what, what that girl's done there, it's a contradiction. And also something interesting that's coming up on this page, because we're only up to about April 2016 at the moment. The rest of the timeline is rolling out over the next couple of weeks. In, in August, something else that's interesting, where that claim of assault is interesting is I then have text messages between Kitty and one of the other girls that was there at the same time, because... India was the girl that was saying that her and another girl was assaulted, right? But then we've got text messages or I think Facebook messages with another girl called Alina. And they're like, dude, th this is crap. Like, what, what was your experience of that night? She says, no, that never happened. So we've got another girl who we haven't put forward yet who knows her, who was there on the same night, who completely disagrees with her story. So that's a cross-contradiction with 
the original girl story who took the thousand dollars cash to go on the tv show people don't know that that when these girls go on these shows they get money oh yeah they, they do and a lot of i know that you know and you know that but a lot of people just you know are sheep you know they'll watch the news they'll mm -hmm. believe what they hear and and you know it's a shame because as you said you know like if you type in like David Otto musician, you know, or David mm -hmm. Otto Australia, all you see is like that, like nine channel nine, you know, yeah. and then, you know, it and takes like the bottom the of the world. page to finally get to your actual, you know, page, yeah. you know, it's just full of like, and yeah, like that's interesting because that's another contradiction, not just from the girl, but from the media as well, because, you know, um, about the phone, like, so apparently if there was never any phone like taken whatsoever, you know, they're still running with this story. Oh, he stole the phone, but then gave it back. Like, you know, it makes no sense, you know, and- I've already got a phone, like, like what do I care? Yeah, why would- But the yeah. thing is that if you want the phone, you can just buy one. Like how, how idiotic is it to even think of that story that a person would pay $4,000 to fly across wow. the, across the ocean to, to steal a phone when it, if you had the money to buy the ticket, couldn't you just buy a phone? Like it doesn't make any sense. And, and, and additionally from what I understand, like um, she was alleging that Kitty was simply attracted to her. You know, and there was nothing, you know, nothing forceful happened. You know, no sexual assault no. of any major took place. Just no, like. No, no. Well, I'll tell you what actually, what actually did happen. And this is the timeline in every case, right? Is when we got there on the Monday, we had a cool Monday, we, you know, met up with the rest of the band members that we were teaching through the previous three months. They could all play the songs really well and do all the moves and everything. And went through that day, got ready, went to the gig and played, and we didn't realise that Nine was sort of watching at the time. And I wondered the way the girls performed the songs was a bit subpar. These are, these are professional performers and actors. So I was like, I wonder whether they got to them beforehand and made them maybe not perform as well as I've got proof of them performing in our, in our webcast. But anyhow, we played the show, all good. The next day um, we had photo shoots on the Walk of Fame and at the Hollywood sign. And everything's still going no problem. So here we are. We, we've been with, with the whole group for nearly 24 hours. And everything's great. We've got footage of all of that. Now, here's the turning point, though. We went out to, to dinner at Taco Bell, um, ju just in West Hollywood there. And the next minute, um, somehow it's come up in conversation that these articles are up. The girls had not seen them before that point. And then as a result, they've then looked them up and then the next minute they then started to act crazy. And that's what happens every time is we're having a good kind of progressive time with people and getting to learn the songs, playing gigs. And then the next minute they're, they're seeing these articles and behaving crazy. And um, what happened in, in India's particular case is the um, – She'd seen the articles and then she got this idea in her head because she was actually a journalist prior to going into movies. She could immediately see that it was false, but she wanted to jump onto the bandwagon. So she had then said to Kitty, hey, look, I'm going to make up false stuff about you guys and make myself famous and boost my career over it. She admitted that to Kitty. But all of that sad, disloyal behaviour only comes after they've seen Nine's other material. And the proof in that is that a person can be learning with us or hanging out with us for weeks to months beforehand, no problem. But then as soon as they see those articles, it's within hours, within a day, they're doing stuff that they probably wouldn't have imagined they'd ever do in their wildest dreams to somebody that they were friends with. Um, but that's why India went that way is because she saw the articles late on the Tuesday night and then was really mean and nasty and, and really was planning an attack as a result of that because she could see money in it and she could see that it was fake, but she was going to jump on the wrong side of it, you know. But with, with every one of the girls that you see in those articles, they, they see the article, like, I mean, every single case, they see the article first and then they side with the media after many weeks of, of having a great time with us. And that's a shame because, you know, you would think that, you know, they would have, they would know you, you know, and know Kitty and know that oh, none of this that is don't. true. And that. That's the thing. It's not that they don't. It's, it, they're really of one of two categories, you know. If, 
if they are silly enough to believe it, then they they just have that sort of you know unnecessarily distrusting response. But more often than not, they are a smart person. They can see the good opportunity it is to learn to play our music and travel around with us. They can see that the articles are false, but they're smart enough to work out. Well, I I don't want them to do that to me, or I I or, know that it's false, but I can't be associated. That's that's the and uh, unfortunately fair assessment that they make at that point, um, but it's not it's not fair on us. It's not ultimately fair on right. Them. It, yeah, um, it's not. It's not um, especially if it's something they enjoy doing. But I can understand yeah. from their point of view, like oh no, like my friends and family might yeah. think differently of me if I'm associated with someone who has all of these articles that pop up. You know, but yeah. Um, yeah. The problem and in which and case it be, doesn't matter who you believe in for me you know um yeah if something like that were to happen to me i think that would be quite hurtful understandable well, yeah, but hurtful a- because you know like <laughs> they know you know they know it's not true but you know they're wanting to protect their reputation but at the same time yeah. it's like you know this isn't true like why can't you you know continue with the band Put, you know, speak the truth, you know, nothing strange is going on. So I, I can get how frustrating that must be, you know, to this oh, day, probably. Um, like you- look, the thing is, that when, when you're already to this stage in your career, whereby you've written 20 albums of music and you've played live 500 times and now played in multiple continents, in multiple continents, you kind of get a bit used to, you know, having challenges along the way. Um, it seems now all of our challenges, though, are external um, kind of forces, and in fact, only one force. If if that one kind of gate were to be removed, we'd get right the way through to the goals that we've had there to be able to play our music to thousands of people and have a cool band that sticks and keeps traveling through. But um, I don't know, when it when it comes to people saying things like that, I, I don't know. You have to let it bounce off it's just more if it causes actual tactical disadvantages like you spend three months training somebody and and they drop away before you actually get a chance to play shows uh, and then you've got a mop up you know mess from them saying things that aren't true uh, that that's you know creates challenges that just in my mind that is slow things down um but hopefully from us overcoming this it becomes an inspirational story to other people that you really can overcome anything like if your fear is that you, you don't want to screw up when you get up on stage to sing it's like dude get a load of this story you got nothing you know yeah. get up there and sing yeah. so no i remember like my first show i was also 12 like when i joined my first band and like my i my biggest fear was like i would drop my pick you know at the time like <laughs> yeah. you know and that never happened, and like after that show, yeah. it was just like addicting, you know, being on stage yes. and everything. You got over the fear immediately, but um, yeah. So, what are your plans like going forward? Like, do you still plan on pursuing legal action to get these articles like removed from the internet? Like, yeah, there's a few stages to that. Um, Really, um, what what our plan is from this place forward is we don't want to just be back to square. Do you know what I mean? Like just to yeah. get the articles down and still have to be at square one building a following. So in a way, um, the petition process is building a following in itself, a, a loyal one. And so the steps in, in the plan towards the goal is is to get you know as many of these you know thousands of these petition sign-ons uh, as, as as many of them as possible the next stage after that is to then have lawyers step in and, and make the presentation to them and say look that you know there's going to be some detriment to you guys if you keep these spiteful childish articles up on the internet they're, they're three years old now why don't you consider taking them down and leaving these people alone so once that's happened then ideally everybody who's you know signed the petition is then likely they want to come along to the show because the petition is powerful in that rather than somebody starting to learn with us or starting to listen to our music and then finding the articles and having that sad turn, if we just begin with the petition and, and own everything that they've been doing to us but tell people the whole story of what they've done, uh, it creates you know quite a, quite a unique um, relationship in terms of loyalty with people because they're, they're 
sad that we've had to go through that in a way. But then they can see the the quality and the substance of what we're offering underneath that, which which is the important thing for them to do. So petition first to so that people know the full story, so they aren't they're immune to to the articles from then. A lawyer to then go forward and make that presentation to them to get all that stuff down. But give us a house back and stop these travel bans. So once all this COVID stuff stopped, that we can actually travel to England and Europe and back to the States to be able to play to the people that we, you know, that want to see us play over there as well. And, um, and then as a result of that, just be able to get to the hundred and the thousand people per show goals that we had there originally, that, that only this one media outlet has stepped in the way of. So once we can overstep them, we've gotten to where the band was always planning to go to, you know? Yeah. So, you know, how long have you been with um, Kitty? You know, she seems like, like, I would say, like a constant in the in the band. Like, so she's been. Yeah, you know, was she, she um, there from the beginning? Yeah. Look, I mean, I um, I was playing music. Ah, uh, you know, maybe ten or fifteen years before before we even met. Um, so yeah. there was a lot of the framework of what we do already in place. So I was already to the point where I could just say to somebody, hey, look, you know, if, if they like music already, it's like, hey, dude, do you, do you want me to teach you how to play an instrument? I've already got this musical written and I know how to book tours and I know how to do a lap bit and, and proposed the idea of drums to her and she loved it. And, and she always wanted to play in a band, always went to watch bands. So she was very much somebody that was just waiting for that opportunity to bring her up uh, out of, she was having a, a rough life before that really. And it brought structure, it brought goal setting and hope and, um, she got out of a lot of, you know, not so good stuff that she was doing as a result. And that's the actual real effect that happens for somebody that joins the band. They get up out of the swamp. They get up out of bad habits that they admitted, bad habits, and and start having goals and passion. And, and now Kitty has this thriving tattoo business that, that she's always wanted to do that as a corollary to playing drums in the band. So, yeah, you know, Kitty's an example of, of what happens when somebody sticks through with this. And it's been eight or ten years now that, that we've been, you know, practicing and playing shows and networking and, you know, take the, the negatives that only one media outlet's put in. It's made her life. I mean, she said to me that that it, it was the reason why she survived through that time is because of the passion and the goals that came from being a part of this particular band. And, and that should be the case for other people. Who, who either join the band or follow the band's music, they should get that hope and that and that feel of that passion that, that we have for the music and, and for them because that's what this has been about the whole time is to enrich people's lives and, and bring it upwards, which is why it's especially sad that somebody would want to get in the way of that. But, um, but yeah, that gives an example of, of what happens and how somebody gets uplifted by what this band offers uh, if they're able to sort of hang through that. Fortunately for Kitty, she joined in before this stuff, you know, had, had begun. And, um, but yeah, we just got to be, you know, fervent about making sure that the correct story is out there about this. And so the people who join in after that are resilient to any of that the negative press that they've tried to concoct. And that's something, you know, that me, I'm very appreciative, you know, that she reached out to me, you know, um, yeah. and that I got to, you know, read, you know, the story, like the actual facts, you know, re do my own research for my own opinion. Yeah. You know, listen to the music myself rather than, you know, um, come across an article, you know, because I could oh, see gosh. how, you know, actually for me personally, if I would have saw like an article like that, I probably, you know, I tend to, you know, question the media in general regardless. <laughs> so I probably would have, you know, checked it out and, you know, concluded on my own it was, you know, false. But, you know, I'm, mm. I'm really like, I would say you're lucky, really lucky to have her because she was so passionate in her messages to me, you know, yeah. about, you know, your, not only her innocence, but your innocence, the, you know, just the draconian restrictions they put upon, you know, yeah. everything that you've have, that been building, you know, and continue to build, you know, it's like, yeah. It doesn't seem fair, you know. I've noticed, like, a lot of times, you know, things in life aren't always fair. But um, I don't, and it's not even legal what they're doing. Uh, it's definitely against the Human Rights Declaration, and um, it's. I mean, I think what they want is for there to be negative, like, consequences that they can have their hands clear of, you know. Um, and 
unfortunately we keep bouncing back and because their passion for what we're doing is so strong and it's such a good outcome in the long run. So I guess that's their right. problem. So are these like, are, are they still trying to come up with like more allegations, these like um, news stations or have they kind of like stopped due to the pandemic? Yeah, two, or? Things, um, two, two things I've noticed have been a particular turning point in that. Um, we, uh, we went over to the States and did our performance in August of 2019 and we have a, a three monthly schedule. It's been, you know, it's been put into stasis while we're, while the pandemic stuff gets passed. But um, we, we had a pattern where we were going overseas every three months to play in different places. And we had shows booked back in LA again for November and actually a red carpet event because one of the girls in the band, Amy, um, she was also in a, a, a premiere movie in Hollywood and she'd invited the band to walk a red carpet in, in November. Um, in 2019 <clears throat> and um so again that would have been excellent excellent press for the band that way and, and show the caliber of girls that are, that are performing in the band as well and as as you may have seen in some of the articles there what actually happened and this is where it's concerning how much they track us is when we got to san francisco um <clears throat> they basically you know pulled us aside and, and put a block on us being able to to travel into the country and we already had it on our mind that we might need to claim asylum for this stuff because we're starting to have some really dangerous effects from the articles and people are seeing them and getting angry not knowing that they are fake uh, people were starting to do some dangerous things like death threats and 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 even you know approach you in the street and this sort of thing so it's like okay we we might even need to seek help from a foreign government in order to overcome this because our own government doesn't seem to be able to or care to do anything to stop this and one of the girls in the band in August, um, she was actually from Russia and she got asylum in America from the communism in Russia. And she educated us about the asylum, like the political asylum process back in August of 2019. So we we're already pretty well versed and had some of the forms already filled out. So the idea was... I recall, to I, yeah, I recall seeing <laughs> something about that, like that, um, yeah. I think it was, I think it was in <laughs> Australia, I think it was um, Channel 9, actually, that was, yeah, that was, it was it a was negative exactly article, problem. but they were saying, like, you were trying to seek asylum, you know, um, yeah, but they, and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, what happened there, though, <coughs> is because of that process, they, they went into damage control, and you're never going to believe what then mm. happened, right, so we're, we're traveling over, <coughs> and then going through customs, um, customers then ask, uh, asking us questions about it and, and Kitty just sort of let it all out and she talked about how afraid she was of these articles and the effects that it was having and the threats we were getting. And as soon as you, you claim asylum at, at a border, um, they, they can't send you back until they look further into, into what had happened because if you get sent home and something happens to you, it's sort of on, on Customs and Border Patrol that that happens. So they've got mm -hmm. a policy that they hang, hang on to the person and find out what's actually behind it. And that might have been what saved our lives, honestly, uh, the CBP in San Francisco because they were really kind to us. And then they, you know, put me up for a couple of months. And um, <clears throat> as a result of that, I had, I had access to a library and resources to be able to type out a 150-page um, document. Well, actually, it was a deposition that I then um, swore in, into the immigration court as true um, about everything that had happened to us in Australia. And it's really, really, really interesting what happened next. They they stopped. They, like, they, they didn't do any new... Um, like, well, the, the, the timing of it exactly is we had, like, I had a first hearing there and the Channel 9 journalist actually turned up into the closed court and was filming the judge, like the San Francisco immigration judge. She was filming him with a hidden camera inside the closed courtroom. And then they broadcast that on the TV. So that was completely illegal what, what she had done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not supposed to that do was that just a, at all. Not at all. And I even, because yeah. that was just a preliminary hearing, I then wrote a letter to the judge and said, look, that woman that you had to throw out of the court um, was actually filming because I've been I've spoken to somebody back in Australia and they said that that footage of, of the court is on the TV now and he was would have been livid about that and it was after that that I then filled out this full 150 page deposition of everything that had happened to us back in Australia and after that moment after that was sworn into the immigration court they there's we haven't heard from them they've done nothing new after that because we completely explained everything that did all the media people all of the corrupt 
kind of police or ex-band members that had, that had been a part of that campaign um, were, were all described in this document that showed out what had happened, why we had made the claim for asylum and, and everything from that. And <clears throat> two interesting things came from that because after we came back, normally when we'd get back to an airport, and the San Francisco judges of the mind that, look, if you just explain all this stuff to an Australian court, that we can trust the Australian courts. That, that was his point of view. So we sort of had this shelter of the political of the political asylum, but back in Australia. And that's definitely how it felt because they would do crickets. Like the, we didn't hear from them after that. They left the old articles up, but there was nothing new. There was nobody at the airport when we got there, et cetera, et cetera. And between having made that political asylum application and on that, they claim that there was some kind of event fraud or something that went on in America and that's when we got hold and then the political asylum was a, was a response to that. But that's false. We made the political asylum application first. We had the documents pre-filled out before we even had flown. So that story is backwards because it makes them look bad because the political asylum was basically to get protection from Channel 9, from everything that they were doing to us. But after making that application and making those declarations, when we got back, um, they we didn't send hear from, we didn't hear from them at all, and then that combined with the hashtag record everything, um, there's been nothing new, uh, which is telling because now that we have yeah, evidence of truth all the time, they're not even trying to lie. That's just fascinating, and there's enough recordings of of the previous times that once that's all out in the public, people will see that everything else that they've said was a lie and motivated by sabotage of this rock band. So is there any legal action that you can still pursue or you know, is that like off, off the tables now? Like, oh, no. It's, um, I, I, still, I still continue. Because, um, yeah, like I still think like from, from what Kitty was telling me and from what I read, you know, like the damage that they have caused has like cost you, you know, money not just in expenses but potential money mm -hmm. from shows that could have been played you know Absolutely. so i feel yeah. like you know they they do owe you some sort of you know more yeah. than an apology in my opinion you know some <laughs> sort of reimbursement you know something yeah you're right um the process is with that um there's a particular and right way to go about it i mean when we had used pro bono lawyers before <clears throat> um Lawyers that are only uh, being paid when you win uh, are more susceptible to being bribed. And that's the experience we had in 2019 right. where they were able to tamper with the lawyers at probably a pretty low price. So it's it's a matter of getting on our feet enough to, to raise the funds to get somebody who's got integrity and can't be swayed by a bribe that way, but at the same time keeping all of the facts in the public eye at the same time because then corruption just evaporates when everybody already knows the truth, and that becomes an important part of that process. So the legal action becomes something very important to float amongst the whole story being known in the public. So that's where sessions like this are extremely important because if the, if the public knows the full truth of what they did and why they did it, when that then floats through a legal process, you just all the corruption goes away. So, yeah, there's probably ten or twelve different causes of action, <laughs> where you know defamation and you know using uh, trademarks and copyright material, um, you know for for ultimately a commercial purpose because they get the you know, clickbait that they get off of um, they get money off of Google for using our name without our permission, um, all kinds of restitution and damages for things. <clears throat> um, you know, special damages for losses of income and, you know, hurt feelings and all those, that sort of stuff that gets covered under that. Yes, absolutely. It's just got to be done a very, you've got to do it very carefully um, when you're taking on the the, the defamation mafia, we, we call it, um, because yeah. they, they just sort of don't care um, uh, who they hurt or, or, or what along the way. But definitely their, their weak point is also where they get their strength from, which is the public. So if the public know the truth, then, and it's about time they did, then that they turn away from them and they, they then, you know, are, are forced to do the right thing at that point. Um, and look, we're, we're going to be successful anyway. Like it doesn't matter. Once we get those articles down, whether they pay us out or whatever, I don't care. I don't need their money. Like we know how to, how to be right. successful anyway ourselves. Um, it, and it take, it's taken that much sabotage to even just slow it down and that's all that they've done. So, um, yeah, I, I guess there's some opening for that. I think it really is about the finding people with the right integrity, so lawyers with the right spirit um, to, to really understand the facts and to fearlessly take them on 
um, with, with knowing what they're what they're like, knowing the shenanigans that they get involved in, and, and not caring, and then pushing for the truth anyway. That's the type of person that would need to be in play in order to have a successful and a proper and a just legal outcome. So we'll need to look around to find that person as we build out the public knowing the full truth. I agree. I just think you know, like the whole thing, you know, seeing people go through things like this, you know, it's a shame. But you know, I must say, you know. You, you seem, you know, pretty positive, you know, about, you know, the outcome that everything will, like, end up, you know, all right, you know, as far as the band, as far as the future, you know, just, like, this doesn't seem as if, you know, you feel defeated, you know, like, yeah, but, you know, to me, it seems like you still, you know, you're not giving up, you're not, you know, gonna just, you know, like, like a dog put your tail between, you know, your legs and crawl away, no, like, like, like we touched on earlier, why would an innocent person want, or a guilty person, why would they want to challenge this with the court? You know, like, and all of these articles, you know, like I, like I said, like, you know, better than, than me, like, you know, they don't add up, you know, it's like, oh, he's, he's, he's a con man. He lures people to join his band. Um, and then they just list like one example of one allegation that, isn't really like nothing really even happened, you know, and, you know, just, mm -hmm. you know, I read about the phone and then as, as you cleared up, you know, I had read, you know, like you said, um, they had it backwards, the whole asylum thing. Like they, they painted the yeah. picture, like after the incident, that's when, you know, you wanted to seek asylum. And you explained to me that, no, that you started that process beforehand. Like, mm. um, so I'm yeah. glad because I didn't I didn't know that this had gone back for so many years. So um, I was under the yeah, impression that. Was yeah, no, it's not recent, and everything they they sort of try to pin on us is actually like long before that is under that they've done. So you know the full picture of of the political asylum protection actually goes back three months to where Alina who was a member of our band who was performing on stage in the footage that, that, they, that they took, the girl, Alina, she had successfully applied for and gotten political asylum because of the trouble that she had in Russia. And she was the one who told us about the process. I don't think we would have applied for it otherwise. So it was cutely, it, it was actually the that forging forward and, and going for the band to be a success anyway, which is what put us in touch with somebody who had successfully gotten political asylum. <clears throat> and it seems to be after we've done that, um, either by coincidence or either because of the effect of it, that that was the last we heard from them in terms of them trying to do new things. So it's interesting how if you just have the spirit to go forward and be successful anyway, unseen forces are sort of in your aid. So that's why you've, you've got to do that regardless because that that was, I guess, the good fortune we had already with everything we'd been through, meeting a leader and hearing about how to make that application is what helped to get rid of them, at least doing any new stuff. And then you know, going through and reading about those legal processes and, and what process a judge uses to assess truth in somebody who's giving a testimony in a court has helped to be able to expose just how much they've lied and every single negative thing that they've said so that people know that and, and turn away from it and ultimately they just scrape all that stuff off the internet. So when you, when you search my name, my songs come up or the latest concert that we've done, that's how it should look for a musician on Google, right? Right. Yeah. And when, when you search your name, you know, it's just channel nine, you know, and the other <laughs> one, um, well, hold on, let me pull it up real quick. Um, yeah, it's just, yeah, no um, nine, nine new nine now dot com nine news dot com dot au. <laughs> and then the videos, just all these a current affair, you know, yeah, like it's all big yeah, for show, US like, asylum. Yeah, and what's funny is star, like just yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. And there's no other news networks. I mean there's in Australia there's a channel seven, there's a channel ten, there's an ABC, there's an SBS, there's all these other like sub news networks. None of them have anything to say about us. The only 
other associated articles are part of their conglomerate. So there are other mastheads amongst theirs. So Channel 9 mm. owns like fair newspapers in Australia. So the reason why there's a Sydney Morning Herald is because Channel 9 owns Sydney Morning Herald, just like they own Ticket Tech and have control over all these venues. So you're only seeing this stuff out of one place. So there, there isn't much diversity in terms of opinion that way. And anybody who looks at the actual but facts goes, why are they lying about you? So, yeah. And that's one thing I noticed as well. I thought to myself, you know, surely, you know, there's other, you know, news articles if this is true. But like, like I said, like most of it is like this nine, you know, channel nine, you know, nothing else, all you know. Um, yeah. All of it or, or something else, it's a masthead underneath their, their conglomerate. Um, if you were to draw an organization chart of all their associated companies, um, it's all linked, you know. Like a current affairs, like is that like owned by yeah, Channel that's one 9? of their shows. So, so Channel Nine, uh, well, actually, uh, Nine Entertainment is the public company, and then Nine Network Proprietary Limit is the TV kind of arm of that. And then that mm. TV station, Channel Nine, has multiple shows. So they've got their own Nine News, a current affair, and they've got other, you know, public interest oh, okay. shows. Uh, bachelor or you know other different kind of shows that they broadcast but the current affair one is is their main kind of flagship show that they use and um but it's it's a show amongst that particular tv network which is an arm of this overall conglomerate uh, nine entertainment um which the chairman of, of that company uh, act, actually used to be the treasurer of the country and sold, you know, gold overseas, and then put money in his own pocket from it. So they're not they're not known for their morals as particular group of people, and right. um, but that's why it's all connected to the same group of people ultimately. So, what would you say, like, um, from your point of view, um, because they're not, you know, like from what I can tell, like everything that I've seen basically is referring to like 2019, you know? Um, yeah. So you said like, what, what started this whole thing? Was it, you know, oh, jealousy? Like, were you doing better than other yeah. artists in the area? Like, yeah, I think a combination of things. I mean, um, they, they had this sort of behavior and probably even a long time before this, but I mean, this particular company, they started in TV in 1957. Um, they opened up Ticket Tech in 1979. So they controlled all these like live event venues all through the eighties and nineties and early two thousands. Um, the, the main person who started the company, Kerry Packer, he died in 2006. So it got taken over by all the people that were underneath him, you know, kind of greedy underneath him. And it was 2011, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure, that it's called the ACCC, the Australian um, Consumer Competition Commission. Um, they fined them $2.5 million for tactically trying to stop people. That the, the actual charge was that they were using their market power to stop somebody coming into the live event industry. So it's a little bit... That sound familiar? Like the <clears> that that's what they were then doing to us, and quite possibly to to a range of other people. Um, and even more of a coincidence, like more you know, funnily timed. That particular year when they did the first article in 2015, they were in the process of both selling and keeping control of Ticket Tech at the same time. So they were selling Ticket Tech to a to a, an Asia Pacific company, but they still had parts of the contract that meant they had control over the Ticket Tech processes and advertising for events. And it was literally like it was about a month before that that they began the deal to sell Ticket Tech. They've then done this article on the 24th of July, 2015, attacking somebody who's selling tickets to an event. And then one week later, the 31st of July, the deal went through for $640 million that they've raised $640 million for selling their ticket arm to raise money to, to basically pay the, the executives in this media company. So the timing of that's fascinating that they would want to be taking out competition in that landscape while they're selling their ticketing arm to raise money. So oh, <laughs> that's why they would do this 640 million dollars i guess yeah. <laughs> funny that but um yeah it, that that's why having the full story laid out and i think what i've got to do is to sort of make almost like a mini documentary out of it um because there's a lot of plot points to the story and to make it easier to follow if i can get it down to maybe a 10 minute kind of the key points so people can see what had really happened there uh, ultimately for the outcome that yeah we have petitions and pull them down but 
their members that learn the songs and stick and then audience members who want to hear that hear that music performed if we've gotten to that then we've overcome the whole thing but yeah there really is just one oh yeah entity that is the problem you know it's crazy yeah anyway if you need any if you need any help um with the documentary editing or anything like free mm. of charge like i do video editing i've worked on documentaries oh, before so so that's something well, like i'm willing to do for completely free of charge you know um really appreciate if you it. need yeah. any help that is you know the the, the hardest thing that i got to do, you know you know where you really could be of help the hardest thing i've i've got to do right now is recount the rest of the story because uh, i as you would have seen on that end of liars page i've recounted up to about april 2016 i've got to dig deep uh, maybe have a glass of wine and i've got to just recount fact by fact in a diary everything from 2016 right up into the current date and, and maybe it'll be therapeutic to do that to sort of get it out of myself but then onto paper because that then becomes essentially the script for the documentary um, so the main mm -hmm. thing that I've got to do next, even before really more petitions is to get the rest of the story out to the current date to really attend to and treat every other false allegation they've made. And, and that then becomes the blueprint that we can use. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go to each different location where each different thing happens. So where they come into the ambush at my music studio, I'm going to go there and film, uh, the dialogue about that part of what they did in the location where that happened and go to different places where I perform my first shows to really kind of show the the full path that this has gone through. But definitely once we've got that footage and the full stories out, putting it all together and, and abbreviating it in a way that it's easier for somebody to understand um, would be super powerful in, in getting more support. So that would be really appreciated. Yeah, and I mean, you know, you gained a fan in me, you know, when thanks to Kitty, you know, I checked everything out. I also have a friend um, in Canberra who enjoys your music. He's kind of frustrated because apparently, like, um, I guess in Australia, like, you guys are back under a lockdown, some sort of, like, quarantine off, and some Off and on and off and on. You know what it's like? It's a little, yeah. you know, it's what's going on with that. But off again now, yeah. But um, he definitely, he likes the music and he loves events. You know, he's really pissed, you know, that he can't really leave because like from what he told me, Canberra is not under lockdown, but other areas are. So, um, yeah, but I asked him, I think yeah, he said, uh, I think he told me like he's about 90 minutes away from Brisbane. Not sure if he's correct on that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, maybe a little, little longer. It's you know, it's driving distance. I mean, if you can, you can drive to Sydney or Canberra is a bit further sort of back from it. Um, we played shows in Melbourne and we drove through from Sydney through Canberra down to there. So, it's it's a drivable distance if they don't have flights. But yeah, it just depends on what they've done at the borders as to what he, whether he can travel different ways. But um, yeah, it, and they they put some cities on lockdown and then take that away and then put another one on. So. It's kind of, yeah, you got to keep a track of where you can and can't go. Even if you're not on lockdown, you're right. You might not be able to travel through a border to go to somewhere else that is for some reason. And that's how it is. Like, I'm currently in, in Santiago, Chile. And, um, right. like, like it's it's strange because, like, in, in the actual city, you know, um, we haven't completely opened up. We, we're on what they call phase three. Phase four is, like, the complete opening to where you know you can right. go indoors and eat but um for example like we can't like go to places that are under like a lockdown we have mm -hmm. to like we can like move around freely but if some place <clears throat> is under a lockdown we can't go and and if and additionally if some place is completely open like outside of the city since we're not you know completely open we can't go you know, so it's really strange right. and, you know, they'll lift it, you know, then put it back on, you know, I see it happening Seems in the like States it. now as well, you know, that's, I guess, a question um, that I haven't like asked, but um, have you, apart from all of, all of this unnecessary, you know, like what I, what I would consider like torture you know, not physical torture, but like it has to be torture dealing with, you know, the media's bullshit for, you know, years. But um, yeah. has has the pandemic affected anything like in terms of local shows or in terms of 
or has it perhaps inspired you in your writing or um, anything? The, um, I guess in, in the main way that it's affected us is the way that it's affected everybody in that you're, you're prevented from traveling to different places to have that visceral, exp visceral experience of, of performing to people directly. But what's interesting is, is we were in a, in a lockdown for like a couple of years before they even put this pandemic stuff in place. That, that's what it felt like for us. We, we couldn't leave or go anywhere without government permission and, um, you know, except for maybe masks and that sort of stuff, that was already the way that we were living. So it was like we were used to that level of constraint. Mm. Um, we were actually uh, ready to go and play in Europe um, at the beginning of, of 2020. Um, but, yeah, because nobody could travel anywhere, that was just the, you know, the, the way it was for everybody. Yeah, it was ruined um, for yeah, so I think that the main way it's affected is, is the same way as with everybody in terms of travel. But the thing that I found really interesting, and this has just been in the last two or three days, it, it's interesting that you bring it up. I've noticed that like bigger acts that are on the forefront uh, of the industry, they're all just getting back to business. Like I'm seeing all of these big concert tour lists now coming out that people like uh, there's a system of a down one, there's a Faith No More tour that's yeah. going, it's international, it's all through that. the States, it's all through Europe. Do you know what I mean? So they're not being held back by it. So they must know something, you know, maybe we don't know yet that it's all going to be cleared up into next year. Like they're still doing some virtual events this year, but everything I see late 2021, 2022 is all, you know, unbridled travel everywhere. And they're expecting to be able to put people into stadiums of 20,000 people. So it, it looks like that's the trajectory of this of the time. So I guess that's more where my mind is. It's how once that all opens back up is, is how can we be on that wave properly this time? Can we peel all this crap away from ourselves and be on that wave upwards as, as that all clears up for everybody? I, I think that's probably where my mind is most when it comes to that. Um, that's how a person survives is just having your, your mind where you actually want to be and bring about piece by piece, you know, how that reality, how you want that to look, you've got to build it piece by piece, you know? And um, so that, that's, I've just kind of been preparing more too, like, you know, getting our, uh, the way we market ourselves tidied up and what our presentations are when we go to people because we, we teach them how to play music as well as performing. So there's sort of more dimensions to when we go and when we go and do a show. We also have workshop elements where we're teaching people how to play the music uh, at the same time as performing it at the later part of the day. So um, it's given us an opportunity to be able to refine those processes at the same time, which has been good. Um, and, and then just working towards what other bands seem to be able to do, which is having live events across the world by the end of next year. So do you, so would you say it's, would you say it's a fair assessment to say that the worst is over? Like you've ex like it looks like those well, articles. I, uh, well, look, they've, the first step would have been to get them to stop making new ones. And that seems to have been the case for nearly mm -hmm. coming up to, well, 2019 was the last one. So, 20, so nearly two years, they've cut it out, you know, and they were doing one every three months for a little while there. So to go two years, it's crickets, like that's a good sign. And it's in part to do with the asylum thing and it's partly to do with record everything because you can't get someone to lie because we'll just put up the recording on the internet, whatever the person says, and prove that they're, they've just lied. So they, they already are, um, are running into zero integrity broadcasts if, if they were to even try. So, yeah, it seems to be, you know, that's where that is currently. And the, the key really is to get them pulled down, get the travel and financial bans lifted so that hopefully at the same time as all these other bands are now able to travel, we can then, you know, step up that level there. But um, there's been nothing new for a long period of time compared to when they were doing the other ones. And um, from recording everything, uh, you know, who knows, what could they even say? Because everything's already, you know, we've got proof that they'd be lying before they were to try now about the um political asylum is that something you still would like to pursue or is that something that's just been like put on hold because of the pandemic yeah that's, or? A, that's a really interesting question um the the biggest effect that it's it's actually really important that you bring this up because even when the pandemic lifts like we're able to travel in australia and play um I'm actually also a citizen of, of the United Kingdom, so I can travel there like I'm a citizen without any trouble. And there's no trouble traveling into Europe to play in France or Germany. <clears throat> the challenge we've got is as a result of the political asylum application, they then ha have it sort of as a corollary to that, that 
you then aren't able to travel into that country for a period of 10 years, um, which is a, a, something of a challenge. That is a, a yet another damaging side effect from what Nine was doing to us. Otherwise, we wouldn't have needed to make that application in the first place to get that protection. So where, where the political asylum application um, has something to be resolved is we need to get ourselves a really good immigration attorney in San Francisco to, to somehow set aside or, or quash that that asylum application as, you know, having had merit but maybe, you know, wasn't necessary to be made given the full circumstances so that it can lift. That's when we, when we say travel ban, we mean travel ban out of Australia but also lift the ban on being able to enter back to the States where we were already starting to build a following by removing the effects of that political asylum application. So we're probably going to need quite a good immigration attorney in San Francisco who knows how to sort of, you know, invalidate the application that we had made in order to be able to apply for working visas and that sort of thing again. So that's um, still really a side effect of what Nine was doing. It's not really related to the pandemic so much, but it's probably one of the, once everything else is resolved, the most important thing to get sorted out. We don't want to have to wait another eight years to be able to play where we were already building up a great following and had some great support. So, so where would the best place for people um, that might be watching or watch, you know, <laughs> after the live, um, where can they go to um, sign the petition, support it? Like I'll put it in the chat right now so they get um, The easiest go. contact point is uh, you just go to Facebook. So facebook.com forward slash the end of liars. Um, there's a link there at the very top, which takes you to a URL, which is um, we've got a WordPress page and it's uh, stop media corruption and music, but there's a link directly to that. So if you go to the end of liars on Facebook, that's the good start point, get the facts, sign on the petition, and then listen to the music, you know, and if you want to learn how to play, we've got a, a like a digital course coming out that people can learn to play the band's music uh, to then be able to perform with us. If, you know, when we're then in their city, they can get up and then perform. And then also just for people to just listen to the music, you know, the, the, the secret really, Oh, um, just to make sure there's a little correction on that. The end of liars, uh, so L-I-A-R-S. Oh, liars, okay. Hopefully the end of liars so, too. <laughs> yeah. Liars, yeah, facebook.com yeah. forward slash T-H-E-E-N-D-O-F-L-I-R-S. You got it, the end of oh, liars, yeah. that's it. Yeah, that's uh, linked through from there to where all the facts are. There's... Now three pages to that. Uh, as I said, I've, I've just got to go through the rest of, uh, you know, recalling everything that had happened uh, and then also putting between the dialogue all the evidence we've got, all the recordings and photographs and documents, um, you know, that that show that they had lied that, that whole way through to some pretty high levels um, and, and to be able to eradicate it from there. And, and maybe the process we've used for the petition would be convincing for the San Francisco Immigration Court um, and and whatever legal processes need to happen in order for them to release the the property that we own and, and to allow travel because see even even when the pandemic travel lifts um, there's still the travel control still sitting on us on us forever until it's legally uh, removed from it so uh, that sort of support's really valuable in order to be able to do that because I mean a rock band needs to be able to travel but I guess they know that and that's why they're trying to get in the way but um, but yeah. Read the facts, son. And one thing, listen to the music. One thing I also noticed is, you know, on your, um, I believe this is the um, Facebook yeah. page for yeah. your music. Yeah, on this one, I noticed you post a lot of things that completely counteract, you know, what the media is saying, yeah. you know, like the oh, truth. Yeah. So oh, yeah. I would also and, suggest and people awesome. check that. Yeah. Um, that and then there's links to a YouTube channel with a lot of the music there. And um, I've got devadotomusic.com coming up and Devadotto Empire as well. Uh, that's where all my books and, and that sort of stuff are on there. Uh, so people can hear samples of all the music because I've got 20 albums that I've written and recorded um, in my own studio and that's the material that we go out and perform. Um, so there's plenty of songs to listen to and a, and a variety of styles. You know, the, the music comes from a lot of different places. Uh, 
in, in terms of stylistically from stuff I've listened to. And and you know, that's, what I, that's what I that's what I liked too. when I heard your music is I could tell you know you weren't just someone influenced by just like one particular genre oh, yeah. or artist. Mm -hmm. You know I could tell you know that you have a wide you know eclectic musical like have um, likes you know tastes and music. Yeah. That. <clears throat> Um, I've always been a, like a, I guess, an academic musician. Like I, I studied music officially all through high school, and then it was I got a university, like bachelor's degree in music. Um, I then ran nice. a twenty location music school for a while, and I wrote all the curriculum for one hundred and fifty tutors to teach other people how to play. So I've always had a really like high scientific sort of level of, of interest and understanding in music, and um, I've got a pretty clear kind of channel between. Uh, having an emotion and then writing a song that sounds like that emotion. Um, I've always had a very clear mm. ability to translate that through in terms of the chords and scales that get used or the lyrics that get constructed with it. And, um, but most of the time when I write a song, in fact, all the time when I write a song, uh, I don't sit down and try to write. Like what happens is I'll either be waking up or uh, I'll hear, just hear a tune. Like it's like I get a song in my head. I have to first check, hey, have I heard this on the radio or, or, or something? Like, or is this someone else's song that I'm just remembering or is this like something new? And then when I can tell, hey, this is actually a new song, um, I'll quickly grab a pad out and I always, I, I don't go straight into the studio. I always write it out first. So if I can hear the lyric first, I'll write the lyric out. Or if there's a melody, I'll actually write like the dots and sticks notation first and draft the whole song out on paper first. And then use that to then go into the studio and just play what's what's straight on the page there. So um, when you see a lyric, it, it's just exactly as it came out as I wrote it. I don't sit there for weeks and rewrite it's, and rewrite because I, I yeah, it's the same for that, me. Yeah, awesome. Yes, yeah. I, I think, and I think like, oh yeah, and I think that you know people like us are lucky like in that because you know if I for example I don't know if this is how it is for you but like if I go into something like okay, I need to make a song, you know, it's not really going to happen. It happens like out of the blue. Like I could be like just playing my guitar, come up with a riff or something, or like hear a bass line in my head, you know, or maybe it won't even be that. I'll think of like a lyric idea, you know, jot it down and then have the lyric. Like it just, you know, it just happens organically. It's nothing forced. If I try to force myself to do something, you know, it's usually I don't feel it'll be my best work at whatsoever. You know, but I think that's the advantage that independent musicians have on people that are that are sort of signed, because if you've got studio yeah. deadlines and you, your managers ringing, you say, hey, look, you've got to finish three more tracks to get the album out in, in the week or whatever. Um, exactly. That kind of pressure can cause you it can cause you to create works that are a little bit like you. You're not really sure whether that's, but you know, you, you're clicking out the, the correct number of tracks, but that might not be where the full juice of inspiration is going to give you three more really, really good tracks. So it may take four and a half months to end up with an album's worth of music because it took that long to have the life experiences for that juice to flow in order to write music worth writing. You know what I mean? And um, that's something I think where we've been fortunate to not have that pressure. The music, some albums happen in a week. It just, the whole, the album title and the yeah. cover artwork and all the song titles and lyrics and the drums and everything just came out in like a week. Sometimes it was a few months for the all of the songs to appear and then it became clear retrospectively, okay, that's that album has, you know, been born now, you know, and now it can be produced mm -hmm. into something. Um, and that, that's actually something else that I guess is the problem for, the established media and record companies is the people that are working that organically are going to come up with material that will touch people in a way that, uh, you know, synthetic music that's produced through the established industry is never going to be able to produce because of the machine that, that is putting that music out. So that's another advantage that independent people have that's of benefit to the public who listens to music, that they're going to end up with better quality of music if people are allowed to, to live their life and be a human being when they go to write a song, you know? So, um, but it, that's the future of this, though. Fortunately for music listeners, that's the future. It is, you know, and I think, you know, it's becoming more clear to, um, you know, aspiring musicians even that, you know, it's best to stay mm -hmm. independent because, you know, signed artists are now speaking out about the fact, you know, that 
you know, their, their contracts, you know, they, they don't own their masters, you know, they're constantly, you know, in the studio, like, oh, well, take, change this song. We don't like this song, you know, come up with something else. Mm -hmm. We can't put the record out of it, you know, this, like that, you know, it's, it's like, I, me personally, like, I still, you know, do music for fun. You know, I have like my own project, which had been put on hiatus, you know, due to the pandemic, but you know, I do production sure. work for other artists and things like that. But, um, mm. you know, like I gave up like a long time ago, the idea of like, f- for me personally, like touring or getting signed, you know, that used to be my dream until, you know, you know, I started meeting, you know, some artists in the industry who were like, no, you know, like it's, it's really not what you think it is, you know, like, especially now. You know, where bands have yeah. to depend more on playing shows or selling merch because you know music now people just steal it you know like <laughs> well you know like it's like Spotify. Same thing. yeah go ahead well yeah i i've noticed more than ever and this is probably just in the last couple of years that this has happened um the musicians more than ever you you just don't need them like you you don't need the established industry at all because if you've got any kind of web presence, if it's a Facebook or a YouTube channel, any kind of other page where you can have sampling, even if you do or don't. And then there's so many ways that you can you can monetize your music so you can get a Gumroad or a Patreon and put your music in there. And it's amazing these days. People don't mind paying for content. So it's kind of like it was when you'd have to go down to the store and buy a CD. So if you've got good music, a YouTube channel and a Facebook, do a little bit of social media networking, and then people come through to a Patreon or a Gumroad, you only got to sell a few albums a week and you can do that full time. And that gets the crap out yeah, of it because the tiny amount of money that they used to give you out of, you know, a thousand CD sales, you had to sell millions in order to compete. Right. But, you know, you don't have to sell very many to be able to just do that full time. And now next week you can sell a few more and the next week you can sell a few more and the next minute you can afford to put a tour on. You don't need nothing from them, you know. It's that easy with social media more than it's ever been. And I, I found that the public is – really happy to just pay for content if they like your samples these days more than ever because it's almost easier to I've, just go through i've noticed Patreon. that as well yeah and i've noticed that um once you know fans actually learn like fans um of like any genre are under the impression you know like okay so i'm paying for spotify so therefore i'm supporting the artist what they don't realize is that you know the amount Spotify pays the artist is virtually nothing. Like, um, yeah. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the industrial act, Velvet Acid Christ. They were big um, in the like early 90s um, from based out of Colorado, but really blew up okay. in Europe. And, um, you know, to this day is considered one of, you know, one of the pioneer industrial acts of like the nineties, like early nineties up to like, like early 2000. He's still putting out material, but like he gets, Mm -hmm. I'd say like, um, like 30,000 monthly listeners on Spotify, which, you know, is quite a bit you'd think Mm -hmm. about it. And he Mm -hmm. told me like, Spotify pays like $120 a year. Like he gets two (laughs) checks and it adds up to, and you know, like you think about it and like, to me, like the music is so great, you know, and he has such a loyal fan base that they will buy, you know, the, like a physical CD Mm -hmm. or a t-shirt or something like that. And they'll support his patron, but like, Things like Apple Music and Spotify and these streaming services, like they're paying, you know, artists, you know, like less than a penny per stream. Yeah. Which I I just think is like unfair, unjust. Honestly, um, this is probably why that, you know, they wanted to have a go at a guy like me because. Uh, as when when we had the music school, I would I would help people to get albums out and do other um, things to do with their actual career, not just you know, how to play and how to write a song. Um, and I, I like musicians being able to, with 
without restraint, without restriction, without deadlines, just be able to create and, and be able to, to sell what they've created enough to be able to just be able to do that. You know what I mean? As long as you haven't rented a yacht or a Lamborghini that you didn't need. Like if you're, if your rent's, you know, 500 bucks a month and, you know, if your expenses are kind of, you know, normalized like that, if your album's 20 or 30 bucks, you might only have to sell 10 of them in a week in order to go, hey, I don't need to do a regular job that might take my inspiration, might take, you know, wear me out or anything. I can just, you know, experience life and experience nature and then create beautiful music from that and, and right. just have even the tiniest little bit of support be able to keep that person alive uh, so that they can keep doing that and keep their internet on so that they can keep on uploading the music. That scares the crap out of them, out of the the established industry, because now, like uh, iTunes and Spotify, were sort of like the big industry quick grab at at the at mm -hmm. digital media, and to still pay out a pittance to artists. But really, the the way forward, Gumroad and Patreon and ones like that, where they take next to nothing off of the top. So if you sell an album or a couple of album pack for thirty bucks, you basically get the whole thirty bucks. So instead of having to sell ten thousand albums to get thirty bucks, you just get it from like one album package, you know? So if you're still producing mm -hmm. music every few months like that, it's so realistic to be able to live off of that. And I really urge people to do it that way, but use these, um, when you monetize it, use these platforms where you get the lion's share of what you produce. Cause dude, like there's no distribution cost. There's no, like, you know, have to print a physical CD and ship it in pallets to stores or any of that anymore. Um, you, you can just get that digital material to somebody's phone and they can enjoy the sounds that you've created in your own home studio. Again, you don't have to pay even for a, studio costs like so um that uh, if anything that's the, the something i want people to take away from this story that you know pockham ev even more than ever before if that's what's made these sort of media entities do this sort of crap to us man everybody go out and produce the best music you ever possibly could imagine make it as tight and as best quality as you possibly can with the resources you've got put it up on youtube put it up on facebook link it off to your gun road and patreon take the lion's share out of it be smart with your money put it back into your music, buy better equipment, don't go over the top. But you can then live off of that in a way that you're not dependent on, on you know, any other sort of source of income. And you're going to produce music that's otherworldly and just amazing to listen to because it's pure and, and it's not being polluted by any of the day-to-day -day stuff. You know, people don't need that in art. They want stuff that's pure and amazing and from another place. And sometimes you've got to, It'd be in a lofty place for for a couple of weeks in order to kind of find mm, that spiritual yeah. place within yourself and you bring that music or that book or whatever back. So, but that's my suggestion to people that are a musician is is do it that way and monetize it in a way that you keep the lion's share, which is not iTunes, it's not Spotify, but Gumroads and Patreons and, and maybe plenty of others make it very easy to monetize in a way that you don't have to so much to be able to to sustain yourself to just do art all the time. It's great. And especially with Patreon, because, you know, like you can set your, you know, price amount and tiers, you know, like to have different tiers, mm -hmm. um, you know, like even something like an autograph or like a video call or something like that, you know, people could pay, you know, between five, ten dollars, fifty maybe for something like an actual physical mm -hmm. signed copy, you know, there's so many ways. Yeah, sure. Um, to wear record label and you know, I think you're right. I think that's probably they they saw what you were doing and you know Everything makes sense now that you've explained really how they have like this <laughs> monopoly over all of these other companies to where they were just trying to Sabotage you just because you weren't playing um, Playing it like how they wanted it like, you know, like yeah. being like um, What's the word? I, I wouldn't call it rebellious, but I would call it um, not like being a sheep in a way. You know, you weren't, you know, yeah. following like the way like the way they wanted you to do it, you know, to make them money. You know, you, you were kind of oh, like yeah. sticking, you know, like to but what you is, believe in. You know? Exactly. But this is this, we've seen this throughout history. This is what. You know, it was Encyclopedia Britannica and now we got Wikipedia. It was Netflix and then mm. Blockbuster. You know what I mean? This just keeps happening as technology evolves. Um, information doesn't go away. Music doesn't go away. But the way that people access 
the, those those things changes and it usually just gets better and better and better for the everyday person because that's human evolution it's doing it this way is better for people that they like to listen to music and it's better for people who produce music you know it, it has completely digitized the entire machine so it's just direct to, to the person that wants it you know and i do something funny in, in my shows that's even more that 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 direct response to people where i have people bring me uh, like a poem or, or like a lyric that they've that they've drafted up to my show, and this is not—I've never heard that. There's not a song yet, but then the, the fan of the show will bring me the poem, and I will sit there on stage and I will compose the song to the lyrics as it goes, like 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 it's like improvising the entire song. So I'll be reading the lyric, and then the whole thing will process to come up with a chord structure and melody structure to produce that song live for that person right on the spot, and they get to have that much of an experience that they have been one and a part of the actual song as it was composed on the spot. And, and that then becomes another song that's, that's part of the show. Uh, I haven't seen anybody sort of, sort of do that, but I think that's something that's only really possible because I've for so long just had that ability to, to sort of channel that way, but being able to do something like that and then selling that as either a live stream or as a pre-recorded concert, uh, you know, that's, that's not something that they're, that they're putting out, um, maybe because of the effect on the artist of the amount of controls that they put in place. They're not coming up with things mm -hmm. like that. They, their mind can't get there, you know. Um, but, you know, Blockbusters are gone, you know. And, and it was actually a point where yeah. Blockbuster had a chance to get a hold of Netflix for like 50 grand, 50 million bucks or something. It's cheap for, for what, what, it was, what it is now. Um, but they, they let go of the opportunity, you know. I, I wonder why these guys didn't mm. just come and you know, go, hey, want to do a deal? Maybe they knew that I would be like, well, what? What do I need you for? Like I can already do this and and do something that's much better for for people. To listen I recall to that it's interesting you mentioned that because I recall that um, before Netflix was the Netflix we all know now, where it's you know a streaming service. Netflix mm -hmm. actually used to be like a mail in, you know, DVD or video game, it's like kind of, um, which Blockbuster had a similar. Um, a similar like system at the time, you know, to keep up with Redbox at the time, at least in the States. But I remember you're, you're, you're correct. Like Blockbuster did have an opportunity to purchase Netflix and they lost out on that opportunity. And, you know, it's kind of sad because, um, you know, going to Blockbuster as, you know, like, I'm 30, I'm 31, I'm going to be 32 soon, but so like I, I was lucky enough to like grow up, you know, where, you know, you would get to go to a blockbuster, search through everything, yeah. find, you know, a movie, you know, um, nowadays, you know, I think there's like maybe one or two blockbusters left in the, at least in the United States. I'm not sure mm. if there's one elsewhere, but yeah, like blockbusters gone, you know, you know, people think like Netflix and YouTube, you know, they've been here for a while, but, you know, I remember back when there was just MySpace, you know, and then came Facebook, you know, so people shouldn't be so naive to think that, you know, Facebook is going to be the only social media platform, you know, that could change like yeah, at true. any given time yeah, as well, you know, something else I think could come out. Discord's kind of done that, and there's, there's really specialty groups that can get together and socialize, and that people would then spend a lot more time with other people with really similar interests on Discord, uh, rather than necessarily spending so much time on Facebook. They might find the Discords on there or find them on Google, but most right. of their online socializing is actually through a really specific Discord group. I've noticed that as well. Like Discord is a really good way to connect, and. And what's awesome is, you know, like things start off, you know, intended for a certain, like, it's my understanding Discord, like, started off really for, for gaming, you know, as a way yeah. to, like, share games and stuff. But now, like, no, like, now there's Discord servers for basically anything, like, have yeah. your own Discord server for whatever, invite the people we want, you know, like-minded individuals, whatnot, so... You're right. Um, I've noticed even on Facebook groups, you know, it's like join our Discord server now, you know, so things yeah. are starting to move towards Discord. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, which again, I mean, that then decentralizes social media away just from Facebook or Instagram, you know, and and even Twitch has done that to a degree as well, where where people are just it they're spreading out to different types of platforms to to network. So, you know, the but that would this this would be like Facebook, like just shutting down every other type of way people could communicate with each other, you know, or or like in the case of Blockbuster, Blockbuster just like trying to take all the assets uh, of the guys that started Netflix, like that's what that's what we've <laughs> been experiencing here. It's really uh, really shouldn't be happening. So. Um, yeah, it'd be good to get to the other side of it, but you know, this is evolution, and this is this is how you know things get better over the long run. And um, but you know, there's definitely some examples of how you know the new school way of doing it that's just better for everybody. That tends to be the thing that survives in the long run, anyway. But whatever's better for people generally is tends to be what what ends up being the thing that that survives for everybody to enjoy. So that's what we're fighting for. Well, like I said, you've got like a fan in me and like anything you need help with, just let me know. Um, like you have permission, like um, Kitty can give you my personal Facebook. You can add me if you'd like. Um, like I'll share this well, out, you, you know. Yeah. Um, I guess what we could do sort of from here on in is maybe maybe look at a time to reconvene uh, in a couple of weeks or a month, uh, to to give me, um, you know, a, I guess a deadline to finish the the full background story of what has what has happened to us that way from 2015 to the current date. Um, it gives you a chance to maybe look through the whole part of it, and I think the thing that's most important is to assess because so much has happened. Uh, assess the key plot points for for a person to understand uh, and to really condense that down. Um, so, you know, if we were to talk again in maybe a month or so, and then I'll have that done by then, um, that'd be the best way to make sure that the full story is out there for, for people to, to know the truth about and to hopefully be inspired by. Um, and for me to, I'm always making like a, like a self-development program out of it in a way by, by showing you what the, the thinking is at each point, you know, so we go ahead and we do this, we book a show that, you know, very few bands are booking, it's all happening, going for it. And then this group comes in and tries to hack at it again, hack at it again. And then what the thinking is behind how to overcome that, that could be useful for people. And um, so in a way that, that, that article, which is the true story of what happened is developing into something of a, of a success mindset and a self-development series that people can take instruction from. So as they encounter each of their own challenges, as they come along, they can use one of those skills or techniques to be able to overcome it and get to the next side with what they're doing with their music or really in, in any you know creative goal that they're setting for themselves. So that's what I hope to be the outcome of that article. It's actually an inspirational story that helps people uh, to show, you know, just what a person can overcome if you're working towards a goal worth achieving and that's what i was thinking as well was that you know you sharing your story it could be you know it can help a lot of people and you know like you might not be the only one that's facing you know these <laughs> these sort yeah, of things no, you're you right. know you know and it might give some encouragement for other people to be like hey you know like i'm going through yeah. similar shit too like i should speak on this you know so um absolutely and the right way to do it, I think, is really important because often when you have people like powerful people like this trying to shut you up, they they use a lot of fear tactics to make you think you're going to get into even more trouble if you speak up. So mm -hmm. you need to know the correct way of uh, of basically getting everything out there, and that's where you know using record everything, um, understanding the process of the contradictions, cross contradictions, like really you know attack the center of the person of what, the person who's lying about you. Attack the center of what they're saying first, and find those contradictions. So if a person has been treated like this, that's really the first thing to do. Because if it's if they're being lied about and defamed, which is what this is, they need to first pull apart what the person's saying and demonstrate to the world the contradictions in it because as soon as there's contradictions one of those two stories is a lie and that's the first way to show out that the person that's doing that to you is up to no good that would be the first technique anybody who's going through anything similar to this even at a local level um you know that you you pull it apart by looking at the contradictions in their story first and then go through the rest of the steps and that's you know and that's the first thing i notice is so many contradictions that's why i was like completely down to do an interview with you you know i was like <laughs> you know like he's being you know mistreated you know slandered like you know just nothing added up like i was like you know like 
I told Kitty, you know, like if he wants to come on and, you know, share his story, you know, let, let him know. And, you know, you're always welcome back on here. Um, one thing she had asked, which I said, you know, I have no issue with, um, she, she wondered, um, if you wanted to like, if you were allowed to play a song, I told her, sure. Like if you wanted to perform <laughs> something like you're more than welcome to no obligation, obviously, but, yeah. um, it's up to um, you, but, um, well, I mean, for the first, uh, I, I guess maybe we want to see what music people like first. Um, so by using the links that we've got there, people can at least tell us a bit about the particular songs that they, that they like hearing performed. Um, the um, I, I like, you know, to, we, we get an opportunity to create something really new when we're talking about the music as well. Um, I guess that would be up to people if they wanted to see that. Um, I, I like the, the interviewing style to be able to get down to the actual facts and, and explain what's right. really been going on, to really utilise that time, like, really, really well, um, especially when there's so much pre-recorded music. Uh, if a person wants to really re request a song to be performed live, they're welcome to. I also have other streams that I'm setting up that people can hear the music too, so maybe that's the best way for people to hear the music and, and our conversations like this help. To, to nourish interest in that because they see that there's something, you know, really interesting going on here with this. So, um, but yeah, um, I, I would point people to the well, music that's already here first to find out what they're interested I in. Would, I would too, because um, most people know that like I have, um, I'm very picky at what I like. If that makes, I have such yeah. a wide variety of genres I like, but if I don't like something, I don't like something, you know, and I'm honest about yeah. it. I don't blow smoke up anyone's ass. Like if, if something sounds like shit to me, I'll straight up tell them <laughs> this sounds like shit, you know, but like, you know, listening to what yeah. I've listened to, you know, like I really enjoy your music. And I think people, you know, that know me know that like I have, you know, a pretty good taste in music. So I wouldn't, I would hope that they, and I also think they would enjoy, you know, your music. Mm. Um, I think it's so important I to do that definitely. to yourself too. Like, if something, like you say, if something sounds like shit, like to say it, I think it's important to do that for yourself. Like if you're writing something and it just, you're, you're properly assessing like, how does this sound? And if it doesn't pass an honest test, don't bother writing the song, let it go. Like just write another one another day, you know? Oh yeah, I have countless, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sure I, I I don't mean to speak for you, but I'm speculating. I'm sure it's the same for you. Like I have like a vault of like songs that, you know, I'm I'm never even gonna release. You know, like even just demos that <laughs> it's just like they're not. It's not necessarily that they're bad. Just like you know, like I guess you could say they weren't good enough for my standards. You know, like I, I, and you know, I've incorporated yeah. lyrics from, you know, those demos into later demos and things like that, or sure. like reused a riff or something. But, you know, there's just some songs, you know, to where like, it's not that really that I'm a perfectionist. It's just that, you know, I'm not going to even release a demo of something if, you know, I don't feel mm -hmm. like, you know, like, cause I like to make music that, it's music that I would like to listen to, whether or not I'm the one that is the composer or the singer, the guitar, whatever, you know, like I make music because I like the way it sounds, you know, like I'll write something that I would enjoy listening to. That's, that's my yeah. personal approach. You know, I think um, over time which could be you... anything. Yeah, exactly. And, and you, you sort of develop a sense, um, for earlier and earlier in the songwriting process to know where that song's going to end up in terms of its quality. So you sort of, you know, hold off if, if the song isn't coming from the right place um, when you're first writing it. And then, um, but if it's, you know, it feels like it's going to be something that's a, a complete song, then that's something that you could, you know, let yourself continue to write that one completely. So. Definitely. What is, is that like? Um, what's what type of alarm is that over there? Is that like the fire? Oh, it's, um, I and we're just in the um, pretty close to the city area here. So there's like a you know there's a I guess they're trying to you know whether they're picking up people who are speeding along the, the roadway here mm. or not. Um, I'd have to see whether it's like ambulance or or, or or police or fire or whatever out the window. But they, they just sound, it sounds pretty active today out in the street. I can hear it myself. Well, um, 
we'll go on for about eight more minutes. We've been, we're about to be on for two hours. Like here it's getting pretty late. It's uh 1104 PM for me. So it's getting late um, yeah. for, for you. You're what are you? Um, 14 uh, still, hours ahead of me, I believe. Yeah. Uh, well, what a one, 1 PM. Right I'm now, on, so yeah, I think it's about 14 1 PM. Yeah. So, but no, that's been good. Like, you know, we've gotten to the bottom of a lot of uh, really important facts to do with this and what the, what our mission really is behind it. Uh, I, I really, I found it interesting that you said, oh, look, you know, it makes sense now why they would sabotage you because not only are we, we've got that sort of independence to a level they've probably never seen before. And then we've got that legal kind of now and we've got the business acumen from the business courses that I've done. I've done event management courses. So there's a real arsenal of, uh, of capability there that they would never quite seen before and arm all that together with the internet and its ability to have you communicate your, your media directly to people that, that spells the mm -hmm. end of, of traditional media. So um, it's, it's interesting that you, you identified that it's very clear why they would do that because of that. Um, but, but also I think there's that the other problem for them is that I've always had passion to when when somebody else needs assistance to help bring them up as well so if somebody else is sitting in a house and they've you know got some songs that that they've written don't wait for some guy to come and knock on the door it's never going to happen like that like just record it on your phone <laughs> upload it set up yeah. one of these monetization things and just be okay with that and then start to build interest in your music and enough that it satisfies what you need to do and you can live off of just doing that and the happiness that it brings is unmatched you know if it if it breeds thousands of people that are living their music that way then we've done better than just you know overcoming this ourselves we've helped to liberate other people at the same time that hopefully that's the effect that we ultimately have out of this story yeah and once again the end of liars like facebook.com this is where everyone can kind of get you know the whole breakdown of everything correct and it has links to you know the petition correct like this is the yeah. the facebook page yeah, that's the, the end of liars. that has the full list of facts and and the petition entry and then yeah the david Auto music facebook has links to the music well, I'd like to thank you for coming on. I'm going to um, get off here pretty soon. Um, I guess we still yeah, have like enough. five minutes. Like, is, So um, is there anything you'd like to like leave with, like um, any closing statements you'd like people to know or like? I, I think we've really covered a good, uh, you know, a good first pass at everything. Um, I would say the main takeaway is um, – Begin with the facts like you did, like begin with the facts of what actually happened here, then sign the petition, then enjoy the music and, and get past all this. Um, and, and, you know, maybe you perform with this. Maybe you come and watch a sort of show. That that's was the reason why why this was born in the first place, and that's where we'd like to see it play out to and, and just keep on getting bigger and better and supporting other artists to lift up the same way. There's, there's a lot of success to go around. There's a lot of people in the world who, who like listening to music and being entertained, and we all have connection with each other now. So, so mm -hmm. why not have that? you know, direct way of producing music yourself and then just giving it straight to the people that want to enjoy it. I mean, we've got that at our fingertips now in a way that we never have before. So let's start, let's start using that and be able to live that dream that way, you know? Right. And that reminds me of one question I had earlier when you mentioned, you know, sometimes you'll be, you'll find, you know, a band member that'll like be around for a while and then read the articles or whatnot. Like, have you have you considered or have you been like i guess you could say like when someone auditions or you find someone have, have you like told them like hey look you know if you enter like if you want to be a part of this band there are these allegations out there they're they are untrue yes. you can form your own opinion and see that they're untrue like is that something you're having to do now or yeah look now, definitely, um, as a safeguard for everybody um, and from anybody disappointment later on down the line, I have made it 
uh, I guess a prerequisite that a person needs to have read through the full background. They need to have, you know, felt enough uh, against that to sign the actual petition and then seeing other media like, like we're producing here today and, and understand the full landscape of it before they begin, you know, spending time with me to actually learn the songs that they are already immune to all that garbage and actually are quite angry right. about it and, and want to go ahead and make an even bigger success of this, you know, because of it all. Um, they're the sorts of people we, you know, we'd want to see up front and definitely reading the facts and signing the petition first is definitely Definitely, you're right, a, a prerequisite to somebody playing the band now. And that should make things, you know, long lasting then because it's the only thing that ever causes a person to drop off is if they see that material uh, after not being kind of pre-armed as to what the truth actually is and, and be, be cynical and skeptical of it first up. If they even bother looking at it after that, you know what I mean? Like as soon as I saw the stuff about Manson, I was like, this just doesn't even sound true. So I didn't want to even know about the rest of it. I don't want it that tainted. I don't want to hear somebody else's made up narrative about a guy that's achieved so many great things. Fuck that. Like I, I just know that his music's great. I know that he's going to pull through from it and just waiting for the success stories that he's pulled up out of it and got more concerts going on. And we've all then survived whatever this campaign has been over the past few years that seems to be coming to an end. It does. And I, and you know, I'm glad that, you know, they're no longer, you know, because as you, as you mentioned, like the last news article, you know, they're, they're from 2019, you know, I haven't seen oh. anything from 2020 or 2021. So like, yeah. I would agree with you on that. Like, it seems like, you know, they stopped, you know, they didn't necessarily, you know, clear your name or remove anything yet, but they stopped, you know, they backed off, yeah. which is a good thing. Yeah. But um, yeah. with that said, thank you so much for sharing your story. I'll be sharing this out, you know, and, you know, promoting it, getting more of my friends to check out your music. Um, I've got friends from awesome. all over the world with, like, great taste. So um, awesome. I'll keep in contact. Um, Kitty said she was doing a tattoo or something at, at the time. Yeah. So, um, yeah, she's got um, that on, on the screen. <laughs> you guys are, you know, always welcome. She can message me. You've got my information now. So, you know, you can add me on yeah. Facebook, whatever. Um, and yeah, like okay. once again, thank you for coming on and sharing your story. And I'll definitely get this shared out because, um, you know, and it, and it takes courage too. You know, I want to applaud you on that because, you know, a lot of people that have, you know, public, you know, allegations of that nature, you know, sometimes, you know, if they were guilty, you know, they, they would want to run and hide. They'd be afraid to, you know, yeah. go on, on do an interview, show their face or whatever, you know? So yeah. to me, that speaks yeah. volumes, you know, You're right. that, um, You're exactly right. Yeah. So, you know, I, I commend you, you know, for, you know, you told me six years of this going on, like, you know, that, that would take a toll on so many people, you know, so many people probably couldn't handle it, you know, at all, you know, yeah. but, but you stuck through it. You've kept your head up and, you know, I hope you continue to do so, you know, because, you know, yeah, I think, you know, obstacles are placed in our lives, you know, for whatever reason, I don't know, but, you know, I think, you know, we're, it takes strength to overcome obstacles. And I think that's something I'm seeing you do, you know, so like that, that takes, it, 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 it does. It's so, you know, it's, it's very beneficial. So with that said, thank you once again, you know, we'll keep in touch and I wish you the best with, with everything. But, yeah, um, you too. No, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about it. It's been good. It's been good. It has been, and we'll stay in touch. Like I said, um, if you want to do a follow up anytime, just message yeah. me. Or, all right. Well, um, so it's the afternoon for you. So I hope you have a good rest of the day. You know, and I'm going to be heading to bed soon. But um, <laughs> yeah, that's it's it's so weird too. Like time zones. Like that's a whole another like topic I'd like to discuss. You know, on my own sometime. <laughs> just about how like you know. We're all on the same planet, the time zones, you know, it, for you, it's Thursday, it's still Wednesday for me, you know, it's 
pretty crazy. Oh, it's so funny when but, um, when we fly on that when we fly to LA, um, we we leave here at like six a.m. on a Thursday morning, and then we literally land at LAX at six a.m. on a Thursday morning. Like it's like no no time has <laughs> passed. <laughs> so gotta get used to that. Yeah. All right. Well, you have a good day, man. And once again, thank you. Will do. And, thank um, you very much. Everyone that's watched and everyone that will watch, again, this Facebook page that's on the screen has all of, like, the actual facts. And then this Facebook page right here, David Auto Music, you can hear some of the music as well. But I, I first would suggest starting with um, this Facebook page, The End of Liars. You know, that'll give you a good, you know, narrative and everything about, of the truth. And then, I, you know, I would also encourage them, you know, after this to, to just see, you know, just for themselves, type in, you know, David Otto Australia or whatever and see that it's just these just like we mentioned these channel nine and and you know the companies yeah just one thing and 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 just see how absurd you know their articles are and and just how slanderous and 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 the oh, words yeah. they use like you know it, it it's almost like a form of bullying you know in a way oh it like is yeah. some of the... yeah but um you it's, have a good day man yeah, yeah. And I'll see everyone else um, later. But if you want to, like, if anything else you'd like to add before we end this? Uh, no, what you said there is good. And, and just to know that it's this thing where we're building our own empire like that, as everybody should in music now, is the reason why they sat back and they were like, you know, we've got to construct a narrative and create a list of words that we need to put on this guy as a distrust campaign because we can't have his story out because then he'll be a major success independently, but so will everybody else, and we just can't have that. So that, if anything, is a real sign to say, hey, look, get in there and use this story to inspire yourself to be better at your music than you've ever been. If, if that's what's come from this, then we've, we've done great. You know, yes, for our own band to get out further forward, but I just want to see everybody else do even better as a result of it and um, have that inspiration be something that brings out music that just wasn't being heard before, wasn't there before, and and now people are able to live that great life as a result of us, you know, being these superheroes who survived this crazy attack on us, but we got through it anyway. That means anybody else can get through any other challenge they have with their music. Right. I, I definitely agree. So once again, thank you. It was an honor to have you on. Um, yeah, just keep in touch with me, man, and keep your head well, up, there. you know. Um, I'll keep supporting you. I feel the you same and... as I did right at the start, you know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like the same person I was before they started doing this with the same goals. It's just, you know, the path might have changed a bit as to how to get there, but you can't let people do that sort of thing to you. You just got to be you and, and get to where you were always destined to go to, you know? Exactly. I, I agree 100%. Yeah, but no, so, this has been thank great. You for, and, um, yeah, I, yeah, it, it was. Um, I feel like it, it was a great interview and probably very eye opening for a lot of people who aren't <laughs> really familiar with how you know shady, you know, corporations and you know venues and the music yeah. industry in general can be. You know, when someone yeah. goes against the grain of how they want things to be done. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. um, that's basically it. Yeah. so i would say Pretty just good. keep being yourself man keep always keep it real you know best of luck yeah. you know so um i'm gonna call it tonight once again thank okay. you everyone else have a good night i'll um see everyone later all right okay nice to talk to you I'll talk to you again soon everyone. see you man